everyone. I'm Mark Cole. If you, if you haven't heard of me, I, I guess uh, I'm best known for research that I've done on Paleo-Indians here in Alabama specifically. I have a lot of uh, people that contact me, professional archaeologists and researchers, for me to share data on a lot of the Paleo-Indian sites here in Alabama. Uh, so I've interviewed several hundred collectors, uh, taken inventories of artifacts that they found and recorded sites that they found with a particular interest in Paleo-Indian. I've published several articles in the Journal of Alabama Archaeology and I had a few presentations at the Southeastern Archaeological Conference. And what we're talking about uh, today is a very specific group of people. These are the earliest known uh, artifacts that can be found in Alabama. And we, we call them alternatively Clovis points, Cumberland points, or fluted points. And they represent a period in time approximately 12,000 years ago. Uh, one of the things that I get asked a lot is what is their relation to Creek and Cherokee and Choctaw and Chickasaw, and there really isn't any relation to them. There's no DNA that shows any link between these people and current native populations. Uh, the only link that they possibly have, in fact, uh, Hayes talked about this in the last meeting, is to a population of peoples that were probably in Asia or possibly in Eastern Europe during the time. But they are the only people that are known to have made these very distinct projectile points with a flute in them. And you can see as we go through time, later in the Paleo-Indian period and into the late Paleo-Indian period, this is Dalton and Big Sandy, and the early Archaic period where we start to see corner-notched uh, artifacts and then stemmed points later, it's very easy to recognize this technology when you pick up an arrowhead in the field or you're looking at a collection uh, because of that distinct flute. There are a couple of terms that I wanted to make sure everybody understood because I may say them during this presentation. Uh, one of those is Pleistocene. We hear the term Pleistocene a lot. In, in geological scientific time, the Pleistocene is a period that is probably about 50 or 60,000 years of time, which included the Ice Age. Uh, the, the Pleistocene was a, a period when man first started appearing in North America. And at the end of the Pleistocene, when we started seeing these very distinct fluted points occur, there was an event that marked the transition to the next, uh, the next time period, which is the Holocene, called the Younger Dryas. And there's been a lot of recent work and discussion about the Younger Dryas in archaeology in Alabama in particular, because it was a time period that probably saw the Ice Age and the glaciers uh, grow a little bit, even in this area and in the coast and, and in the north. A lot, of, a lot of people got driven from the north into the south during the Younger Dryas event. Very high levels of rainfall. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's kind of a very important event between the Pleistocene and Holocene epochs that uh, occurred during the period where, where the transition in, in cultures was taking place here in Alabama. This is a distribution, site distribution map of Fluted point sites in North Alabama. Uh, we have 380 fluted point sites uh, just in the counties that are bordering the Tennessee River. Uh, you can see that there are some very discrete um, clusters of, of sites that occur in, in kind of unique areas. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting when I first saw this image was here in Colbert and Lauderdale County. Not only do we have clusters, but we have a very distinct round appearance of their settlement here in this area. 
Uh, in, in the other parts, and I've written papers about both limestone and Madison County, but in the other parts of Alabama, particularly here in northern Madison County, these are Paleo-Indian sites and fluted point sites, but they're sites that have only produced one or two fluted points. They're not very dense, they're very light, and they mostly, you're going to mostly find Dalton and early archaic artifacts on these sites. <clears throat> But as you go into Limestone County, where the quad site's located, you start getting into very dense fluted point sites. And a dense fluted point site would be one that produces 10 fluted points or more, okay? At the quad, there was a series of sites, and, and this was very famous in the 1950s when it was discovered, because 200 fluted points were found here. And it, at the time, was the largest most dense, the, the highest number of fluted points of any group of sites in the nation at the time in North America. It's been surpassed by a couple since then, uh, but it's still a very important site. Uh, but as I started looking at Lauderdale and Colbert County, I noticed we've got the same, the same kind of density. And we've got some clusters here that probably have 200 fluted points from them. Uh, we've got this Coffee Slough region, this P1 Gunwalford region, Pride Landing, Heaven's Half Acre, and some other places that are very dense. And so I thought that it would be interesting to kind of write a little bit about, about these cultures that were here and what they were doing and why we may see clustering occur here to bring this these sites specifically into where we live here in Colbert and Lauderdale County, just a little more detail into where these are occurring, Heaven's Half Acre, Brush Pond, and then some that a lot of people haven't even heard of before, this group of sites at Blue Water Creek, uh, on top of my house. Yep, Coffee Slough, Pride Landing, Gun Walford, and this group of sites called P1. Uh, there's 112 fluted point sites in this region. There's one in, I'm sorry, another cluster in Upper Shoal Creek. These all occur within about a 20 mile range, which if you read about Paleo Indian range, uh, 20 miles is right at their daily uh, ability to travel. Uh, and not only are we seeing very distinct clusters, but very few sites occurring outside of these clusters, which I thought was kind of interesting. <clears throat> so why, why do you think we would see really big clusters, really tight clusters, and then just gaps in between all these areas? Well, we know why sites cluster. They cluster because there's plentiful resources. It doesn't mean that in these areas there weren't plentiful resources, but there was something happening at each of these individual sites that made early man want to be here. I think it, right term. I've been thinking about a lot of, about this very topic for at least 15 years. I believe they were living in these tight clusters because they were reliant on different families making different products. And when they came into their habitation site, they were focused on those products. And then, one, and then once the products were finished, they could bound out, go hunting, and then come back. And by living close together, it was easy easy to trade. So if you, if you look at Gar Slough as a, a complex and Coffee Slough and Tribe Landing as is one complex on both sides of the river, and then Heaven's Half Acre is one complex. They were those complexes were occupied at the same period of time. So those three those three groups of people knew each other, but it was it's three different complexes that supports a large population that allowed e easy trading. And and I don't think they thought of it in these terms, but it also allow, allowed for a better genetic mix between the three populations. If you're separated, pretty soon you're going to run into ge genetic anomalies with, with, within your given population. Right. So uh, they were relying on each other, I guess, is the short my short answer. Well, let's talk, about, 
Let's talk about contemporaneity for a second because uh, Hayes brings up a good point. Uh, is there a way that we can know whether all of these sites were occupied at the same time? I don't know if we can ever know that they all were occupied at the same time, but we do know that at Heaven's Half Acre, there are two examples of projectile points that were broken and pieces found on different parts of the site, which does indicate that those sites within Heaven's Half Acre were probably contemporaneous. And if Heaven's Half Acre was, then it's possible the rest of these were. So we're going to look at each one of these, though, individually. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit more about Paleo-Indian culture and, and ask you guys uh, a couple of things. We talked about why sites cluster. We mentioned resources in particular. But other reasons why sites cluster are quarries. If there's a raw material that's there that uh, is particular, uh, particularly desirable for them, then they'll cluster around those sites. But I've, I've wrote a paper recently that proved that Paleo-Indians in Alabama probably weren't depending on a one specific resource for, for tool stone. They were using whatever was available in the region they chose. Uh, bottlenecks like we see on the Tennessee River where in Colbert County we have bluffs and then on the Lauderdale County side we have a floodplain. Obviously that's going to cause the sites to be more on the Lauderdale County side than they would be on the Colbert County side. And then crossings, uh, we, if we start thinking of these people through the eyes of a hunter rather than just a projectile point maker, somebody that made beautiful artifacts. These, a lot of these sites are occurring in places where there are historical fords, uh, especially in creeks and rivers, and they're gonna congregate in places like that. But then there, there is survey bias. Uh, there, when collectors collect, they tend to go back to the same site over and over, especially if it produces artifacts, right? So there are there are other reasons that bias could play a role into why these sites cluster. But here in North Alabama, particularly, cultivation and erosion along the Tennessee River has taken such a, <clears throat> a heavy hand that there's really no limit to uh, the visibility of sites here. You could, if there was a site there, you could find it. I want to just take a step back now and let's talk about and think about Paleo-Indian life and what each of their sites would have looked like during this period 12,000 years ago when they were here. We've already talked a little bit about a quarry. I think most people understand what those look like. But a base camp, let's think about what a base camp would have looked like. It would have been a, like Hayes was talking about, a group of people gathered together in a group telling stories and sharing information, um, preparing shelters and probably um, weapons and processing kills and children playing and, you know, uh, parents and all the types of things that you would think of as a community right now. And then you have hunting sites uh, these hunting sites are the kill sites, they're the places where they would have actually uh, taken game, processed game, and brought them back to the base camp. And then temporary camps, which are going to be hunting sites that are away from these larger clusters, uh, and they're typically going to be found on Shoal Creek or Blue Water Creek or some of these other creeks that go into Tennessee from the Tennessee River. And then a complex which is a group of some of all of these sites. Maybe multiple base camps, maybe multiple hunting sites, but it's a group. Now, if we think about what was happening at these sites, which of these sites would have the most fluted points? Where are you going to find the most fluted points, in your opinion? Are you going to find them where they're sitting around and repairing tools and sleeping, Charles? Source of water, drinking water. Mm -hmm. Sources, yeah. 
Or are you going to find them where they're actually using these artifacts? And I think that's one of the keys to what we're going to be looking at over the next few slides is uh, what we're seeing are very specific site types. Uh, if, we, if we can picture what these look like, again, just to kind of help everyone's imagination, a base camp, you know, children and, and women and shelter and cleaning animals and creating tools and all these other things, clothing and everything else happening right here in this one specific area. There's another example of just a small base camp, family base camp. And then you got hunting sites where they're actually making kills and skinning animals and probably doing some preserving. And then temporary camps, which are a little bit away from their larger camps. And then a complex, like Hayes was talking about, a group of these, a community, where they came together, where they sat and shared information, told stories, taught the young, had their children, raised their children. And I think that may be what we're seeing here in North Alabama with these clusters. One more thing that I think that we need to think about as we're imagining what these sites would have looked like, there was a very important excavation performed at Dust Cave here in, on a bluff just above Coffee Slough a couple of years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, does anybody here know what the primary fauna in the Paleo Indian? Well, I don't know what it's fauna, but uh, uh, the primary food source for the investigation and what they had in the cave with them was waterfowl. Exactly. A lot of their diet, and I've always wondered whether they trap them. I don't think they'd use those big foot points to, uh, you know, knock a goose down. Mm -hmm. for instance. I, think, I think they must have had a more clever way of getting to those waterfowl that they were eating. Right. It was waterfowl. Waterfowl was the number one food source of late Paleo-Indian culture at Dust Cave. Can I ask something real simple? Mm -hmm. Where's Coffee Slough? Uh, so if you uh, got in a boat and you went past McFarland Park, yeah. um, it would be right there on the right-hand side of the river, north side of the river, between Seven Mile Island and the river bank. Coffee. That's Coffee okay. Slough. So <clears throat> if, we, if we now know that fauna was number one, the number one resource that they were using, is there any technology that we aren't finding at these Paleo-Indian sites that we know they had to have had? They probably had specialists that do a lot of the chipping, too. Probably. Not everybody could do that. Now, we have, to my knowledge, we have not found any nets. Right, but they either, probably had nets. Either they, fish nets or bird nets. Mm -hmm. And probably other very simple tools like just pointed sticks. I mean, I don't think that we can rule that out. Clubs and things like that. Rocks. Yeah. Rocks. They had baskets and maybe had some food leaving. Absolutely. Basket and it knocked over a stick and got captured. Exactly. There's a lot of things that we don't see in the archaeological record during this period that we can infer probably existed, right? Especially since we know that waterfowl was the number one thing that they were capturing but then other things that we don't know is how large was the group how much food was required uh, how many people were participating in hunting and we don't know dust cave was and this is going to be difficult for people that don't really understand periods to understand but dust cave was a dalton late Paleo-Indian site. So these people were two or 3,000 years before Dalton. And not only was Dust Cave Dalton, but it was also a fall winter camp. It was not a base camp where they were there year round. It was not used year round. So there were some things that were found, some of the findings at Dust Cave we can apply, but then there are other things that we can't because we don't know what was happening in the early Paleo-Indian period. For instance, out west, when, when they find Paleo-Indian sites, like at Dust Cave, there's waterfowl, <clears throat> but 
when they go into the early Paleo-Indian period, they find they are still hunting megafauna or whatever the largest mammal was if megafauna wasn't available. And Paleo-Indians, regardless of where they were, were very intent on taking the largest game. Uh, and I think there are a couple of reasons. Go ahead. There were probably a lot of moose around at that time. I understand from evidence at uh, Mouth of Cane Creek that the water table was about 30 feet higher uh, back in the paleo days than it is today. Mm -hmm. So thus the whole ten broad Tennessee Valley was a kind of a marshy, wet, wet place. It was, and especially was south. Yeah, especially south in Muscle Shoals. So <clears throat> if we know that they were hunting waterfowl, we know that they were hunting megafauna out west, they were probably hunting megafauna here, or the largest mammal available here. How were they, how were they gathering? How were they capturing these animals? And what would this look like when we, when we look at a Paleo-Indian site on a map or actually walk out onto one, what is that going to look like in the archaeological record? And what does that mean here in North Alabama? Did they not capture game in North Alabama? They did, we obviously know. <clears throat> Waterfowl was number one. They had to have nets, probably had nets, probably had baskets. Mammals were second. But of the mammals, white-tailed deer was a very small percentage. Very small percentage. Fish was number three, and reptiles. Turtles, frogs, other amphibians was number four, but a wide margin. They probably had watercraft. Again, probably had some type of spearing technology beyond just fluted points. But the romantic view of the Paleo-Indian is always going to be hunting megafauna, that mammoth, right? Man versus mammoth. That's, the, that's what people like to think about. In the West, we think a lot about kill sites being where they ran buffalo or bison off a cliff. But this is a very, very highly romanticized view in terms of new technology and new findings. And in fact, Paleo-Indians were probably more like this when they were hanging. They were in harm's way on the flanks trying to capture whatever game they were capturing. In North Alabama, there were maybe bison, <clears throat> but the largest game would have been elk, caribou or elk, ground sloth, short-faced bear, and a type of pig. These are gonna be the largest game with, with white-tailed deer. <clears throat> Yeah, I have a, one person that's been very interested in my work and I've talked with a lot is Dr. Brian Gordon, who is uh, writing a book about caribou hunting in North America. He's the, he is the Museum of Canada, some kind of archeologist there. And he's convinced that caribou was the number one primary source for every Paleo Indian in North America. I don't agree with him. But I do think that we, uh, as Paleo-Indian researchers, have sold ourselves short by not thinking about the places that we find as possible hunting sites. So let's talk about hunting. Let's talk about big game hunting without a rifle and a compound bow. How do we do that? And there's ethnographic evidence for all of these types of hunting strategies that early man used. In the West in particular, we see examples of where uh, early man, Paleo-Indians, Clovis people actually changed property to create hunting sites. Uh, there are a couple of types of ways that they would hunt. Number one, they would choose an area where there was game, surround the area with people, and then slowly walk together 
until the game was left with nowhere to go and take their game. They would use blinds, which, you know, it's like having a hunting blind now, sitting in a hunting cabin or up in a tree. They had blinds or camouflage, and they would wait until game came by. But the best archaeological evidence that we have was that drives were probably their number one technology for capturing game in hunting. And in the West in particular, I'm going to show you guys a picture in a minute. In the West in particular, some of these drives can be extremely large, man-made with stacked stone fences or stone blinds up to three miles long. And they're also built modularly so that if you didn't have enough participants to run that entire blind, you could just run a section of the blind and still capture game. But would, could we possibly have something like this in Alabama? I don't know. So let's, let's look at some of these sites here in um, Lauderdale and Colbert County through that lens. This is an example of a surrounds over a one mile area, you got people standing around, walking towards a funnel, driving game into a kill zone. <clears throat> and then this is an example of a Pato Indian drives lines out west where they are actually using topography and building lines for hunting. And these circles are blinds that would flank these lines, they would try to drive the game through here and into a kill zone, okay? Coffee slough, let's talk about coffee slough for a minute. Coffee slough is, it may be the, the most highly used site in North America in the early archaic period. It would not surprise me if the early, if the corner notch people even started at coffee slough. I mean, there's just a ton of artifacts found here. But the majority of the sites that you find in that region are not Paleo-Indian. They're early archaic, possibly Dalton, unless you get on the north side of the riverbank and then the floodplain adjacent to the bank, you'll find early sites. You don't find them a lot on Seven Mile Island you find them on the bank. So Coffee Slough is probably one of the, there have been archeologists for 30 years that have talked about Coffee Slough, but Coffee Slough really isn't as dense in Paleo-Indian sites as a lot of people believe, you know, once you look at the data. And there's probably actually only 30 to 50 fluted points that have been found in Coffee Slough itself. But again, Five miles north of Coffee Slough, a mile east or a mile west of Coffee Slough gets really dense. So this was part of where they were, right? Probably, if you think about a base camp, this would be a good place to have a base camp. And that's probably why we're seeing a fair number of artifacts, but nothing crazy like we're seeing in other parts. Mm -hmm. May I mention something about Coffee Slough? Sure. There are a lot of caves along that block line. I mean, really a lot of them. Many of them have been uh, opened up. Right. Because the debris is still in there. But guess what? They generally face south so they can get the southern sun during cold weather. So that may have been one big attraction. And they had fresh water running right in front of them. Yeah. It would be interesting to so go to one of these other caves, Key Cave especially, I think would be an interesting place to look. It's actually right here. Uh, the uh, Collier's Cave is so close to Dust Cave. Mm -hmm. It's got a huge opening. Right. Collier's Cave, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would have thought that it would have been a, a more heavily used site, but I think I don't. And I just wondered because it was so heavily used from a recreational standpoint, 
I mean, because when I was growing up, we would camp in, inside that. Yeah. Place. So Scott is an archaeologist. He actually surveyed those caves. Sawyer's cave was also mined for saltpeter during the Civil War. And they removed pretty much everything. All the soil from six feet in depth. Mm -hmm. And anything that was there was long gone. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. It was because it was so hidden. We used to think whatever would have been there is probably, yeah, it's been, it's been stripped out. It was. But I, I, I would have thought that that would have been a more heavily used cave than dust cave. Right. Yeah, my, my dad and a friend of his actually mined that the dirt out of Collier Cave and sold it to old ladies on Wood Avenue <laughs> for potting plants. For fertilizer, yeah. And I think Collier Cave was also a bad cave for eons. Yeah. And that's just, no matter how bad you need shelter, you're not going to fight that for it. Just right. The stench. Yeah, the other, uh, another thing that we need to think about, and, and Key Cave and Dust Cave, probably not as much as possibly Collier's Cave. Uh, one of the reasons why we see early archaic sites, the, the uh, black dots here are early archaic, uh, the red are fluted points. Early archaic are possibly late Paleo Indian Dalton sites. In the Pleistocene, period, we talked about the Younger Dryas, and in the, in the Younger Dryas, there was so much rainfall uh, that if, if you can just imagine what the Muscle Shoals looked like when it was flooding, good Lord, you wouldn't want to be anywhere in this area, right? Because you're going to get washed away. <laughs> and they knew that. And that's why they tended to put their sights farther up on the riverbank along the tree line and south too. This is one of the few places where there aren't any bluffs. But south too, uh, because they, they knew they didn't want to get washed out. You know. There's a few Paleo Indian sites here, but nothing like what a lot of people would lead you to believe. If we look at it from a satellite view, and the light's not very good, but again, you can see that these, are, these sites are occurring in this floodplain. This is the modern riverbank in this floodplain, and not on the second and, and first terraces away from the modern riverbank. And then a couple of sites near Key Cave and Springs. So you, Paleo Indians here, I think this was probably a base camp. Uh, a good example of one of the islands in Coffee Slough, another group of islands in Coffee Slough. But Coffee Slough, in, in my opinion, is a little bit overrated. We're going to talk about some more of the way more dense sites. Blue Water Creek, this is a site that very little information has been made available on. But it was discovered in the early 80s by uh, several guys that collected here. Uh, this is probably the most, one of the most dense unrecorded sites, uh, fluted point sites in North Alabama. LU-488 during the Surface survey for Paleo Indian sites by uh, Greg Weisenkopf and Sid Hyatt and their crew. There were two Clovis points found at LU-488. And a couple of collectors have shared with me that there's, there's one collector actually uh, have his collection now, had 10 fluted points from this site. And then one of the collectors that was part of the Weisenkopf Height survey had several other fluted points from this site. So this was, this was a very dense fluted point site, probably up to 25 known fluted points and then another 25 estimated, so maybe 50 fluted points. Now to put that in context, 50 fluted points would make this the third most dense site in Alabama and top 10 most dense fluted point site in the southeast. So this is a significant site. But this site, this, this layout of sites, if we go back to the definition of a hunting site with observation areas, this fits that description perfectly, right? So this was a hunting site, fluted point hunting site. Now from a conservatory perspective, it's been, as, as she mentioned, uh, She's got her house here now, right? So we can't really 
study it much anymore. But during the 80s, this was a very prolific Fluvia Point site that several collectors knew about. Thinking again, if you can ignore my art from a, the perspective of a hunter, they've got their base hunting camp situated in an area where springs are emerging and into the floodplain. This is a bluff area here along the Tennessee River, and they've got observation sites to watch for herds crossing in this region. And then there's a small sink in this area. I don't know how much they uh, paid attention to it, but if you notice, there are camps on all four sides. So something important about that sink also. Upper Shoal Creek, we'll look at another group of sites. This is probably the lightest group of fluid point sites in my study area. It was discovered by Holly Allen. A lot of y'all know Holly, or knew Holly. Jim Miller and Thomas Cruz had collections from here. And these are his examples of temporary camps in the upper portions of Shoal Creek. And they're located in areas where the floodplain is wide and there's a ford in this area. Each of these are located near a ford. Another satellite view. This is a very rural region. Jen and I drove up here and I got a picture I'll show you in a few minutes, but these, this group of sites here are more dense than uh, these. These are probably one to two, this is a, a little bit more dense fluted point site, but we're looking at 15, 10 to 15 fluted points from this group of sites here. And to zoom in, one of the features that's interesting, you can see the ford, historic ford that was in this area. These sites sit on a ridge that kind of ascends back up into the mountains, so they could have been observation sites as well. And there's actually a couple of fish traps in this region, and this is a, this is a blow up of one of those fish traps. You can actually see it from satellite view. That's Savannah Ford. Ford. There's a photograph of the beggar lice and the site. And then, if you excuse my art again, just a quick drawing of what we're seeing here. Fords and fish traps. We don't know if the fish traps were prehistoric or not. Uh, but they do occur. There's three that I've been able to identify. Steep bluffs outlining Shoal Creek in this area on the north side, and then these fluted point sites occurring on the wide parts of the floodplain uh, against the hills where springs are coming into the Shoal Creek. One interesting story about this site. I like to tell stories. Uh, one of the people that I surveyed was Ronald Pettis, who was a teacher at Rogers High School for many years. And he told me a story of a young man who brought half of a very rare fluted redstone that was about this long to school with him one day. Ronald said, if you'll bring the other half of that tomorrow, I'll give you $5 for it, right? So he did. And he bought it, it was from this site, but it's a very large redstone. There's only 10 known from this area, from this region. Very interesting story. Another group of sites that are in Colbert County, Nitrate City, I think again, these are probably temporary camps. Roughly 20 fluted points coming from this area. Some of you may be aware of these sites. Uh, They've been known about for a long time, and there's a lot of survey bias associated with these sites because they occur south of the Reynolds metal plant. So several dozen people have collected these sites over the years. The most dense sites are here and here, and they probably have four or five fluted points each. And then this is Nat Pond, and these again are three to four fluted points each, but an upland hunting 
location, a long pond creek. If you look at it from a satellite view, you can kind of see the swampy areas here at Nat Pond, and you can see Pond Creek. And then just a quick drawing of how this might have looked, how they might have, how Paleo Indians might have looked at this based on just the distribution of the sites and the way that the land lays in this area. Uh, you could just maybe see sites flanking this ridge that were where they were making kills because it would have been easy to herd animals into here between these two sinkholes. Lowland, animals are going to want to stay on flat land if possible. As, as you disturb the herd here and you made several kills, if the, if the herd was going north to the Salt Lake or going south back at, back at the Savannah Plains, as you disturb the herd here and it's going north, you just move down to the next one, you catch them at the other crossing as well. Yeah, I, th I think that that's probably what was happening, especially if we, we'll go back to that in a second, but we're at the end of the presentation. But if you look at the, well, let's go back to that real quick. So you got eight or 10 on the first hit, 15 or 20 miles away the next day, you got eight or 10 more. Yeah, let's look at that real quick. So this is Nitrate City. So I think what, we're, what we may be seeing, and this is, this is way too early, <laughs> right, for me to even say this. I was gonna say this at the end, but You've got herds of whatever they were hunting coming right through here. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, of course, the smaller sites where they're performing hunting are going to look the same way. All right, now we're going to get into some really dense sites. And, uh, of course, everyone's heard of the famous legendary Heaven's Half Acre. We have at least 260 fluted points confirmed from these sites. A lot of collectors believe up to 1,000 fluted points have been found here. And many researchers are beginning to think that this may be the most prolific fluted point site in North America. There's been a lot of survey on this site over the years. It's located in Colbert County, kind of southeast of Leeton, and it's located along the margins of a sinkhole. If you drive through here, and I'll show you pictures of it, this, is a, this holds water almost all year long. And these sites are occurring along the margins of that sinkhole. CT-161 is the site that Heaven's Half Acre was named for. It is the actual Heaven's Half Acre that was first discovered. And then all of the ancillary sites were discovered after that. Satellite view here, you can still see the marshland and the higher ridges where you've got observation sites. And then this is a photograph of looking south to CT 161. This is along Fennel Road of Heaven's Half Acre. During heavy rains, this area still floods so much that Hayes and I actually canoed to these sites one time. Uh, it fills with water. It's like a huge lake, right? And I've got a photograph. This is when, this is one time when um, Jen and I drove out to it. But you can tell that, you know, during the Pleistocene and heavy rains, this was covered in water. And of course, the only land you can see on this side is CT-161 and any of the sites that were on the margins, now, like 529. Ago, they raised the road up. Yeah, <laughs> right. So that Not so bad, yeah. So let's think about Heaven's Half Acre, though, from a hunting perspective. And the way these sites are distributed along the margins of these sinks, you know, you could drive game into here, you could drive game into here, into here. I mean, if we start thinking as a hunter, it's pretty easy to see that this could have very easily been a place where hunting took place. Mark, when you talk about kill zone, what would that look like? So a kill zone is, is, a kill zone is where the actual 
taking of the life of the animal took place, right? That's where the, the flanks would converge and capture the animal, right? So it would be like a spear was thrown. Uh, not necessarily. It would just be between two blinds. These are blinds. If you think of these as blinds, they're being led into a funnel, and at that funnel is where you're going to take your game. So again, there's several places where you could imagine this happening. If you think about the elevations at Heaven's Half Acre, uh, the topography of Heaven's Half Acre, this is actually a ridge. And this pond sits within another, these dotted lines are supposed to represent the greater low-lying area, the greater sinkhole. But it really sits in a bowl right with just these little small high spots in between it so if they drove game into here um, they would have had a field day you know hunting down on animals from heaven's half acre i don't well they could have run them into the swampy areas in the west they didn't i don't know why they did probably didn't want to go in after them they would wait till they came out and capture them on the other side. Brush Pond is another very well-known site. This site is just southeast of Leeton High School. This is the site that Horace Holland would take all his students to uh, during class. There's at least 33 fluted points confirmed from this site, and a 50 or so that have probably been found here. But another area that's probably a hunting site, could be a hunting site, around a pond, two ponds. If we look at satellite view, and we'll just go to the next slide. Again, you can see potentially blinds, flanking areas, running the animals through these flanks, and then a kill zone in this area. Now we're going to get into a couple of sites. These last two are sites that, like Blue Water, very little information has been shared about these sites. But uh, this first site is on Gunwalford Road. If you drive down Gunwalford Road, you can kind of see where this would have happened. My dad and I actually drove down here to try to identify where some of these kill sites might have been. Uh, but these sites were discovered by some high school students at Bradshaw High School in the early 1980s. Uh, and then Weiselkopf met them while a couple of them went to Auburn and they came back and recorded them for the Alabama State site file. But these are very dense fluted point sites. One of the sites that we're looking at here in this area, LU-440. During their survey, there were four fluted points found on that site, which is pretty amazing to think. During a surface survey, one day surface survey, you find four fluted points. That's a pretty rich site. Probably somewhere between 50 to 100 fluted points have been found here. This ridge line actually is a bluff line to kind of give you some perspective. And then these sites sit on a high place when you see the picture you'll be able to see it higher property uh, down into lower property and again you'll be able to perhaps see what a drive line might have looked like in this area but here's a a picture of one of the fields this is from the road and you can see the bluff line here paleo indians in the west especially would have used natural features like this to drive animals herds this is LU-440. You can see it situated well above the rest of the land here on this property. And then again, uh, just imagining what this would have looked like. Again, this is our bluff line. We don't know what was up here, but I would be willing to bet there's fluted point sites here in these woods. Uh, but a bluff line, a sinkhole, and then we have blinds or flanking sites uh, here on this side, so I suspect this would be a kill zone. And then at LU-440, where this is the highest property, right? Again, they're possibly running them through these, this low-lying area, wet, swampy marshland, and flanking them. Is this a sinking creek? Sinko? This is not sinking creek. 
I'll look at one more before we talk about uh, another site. Pride Landing. This site's been known about for several years. I know Charles has several fluted points from this site. But it was actually discovered by uh, Bill Butler and Sam Mosley in the 1950s. And of all the sites that I've shown and I'm going to show today, more people talked about this group of sites than any other place in Lauderdale or Carpet County. Heaven's Half Acre would be the only one that compared. We have 20 flu points known. Most of that's from collections of people that are in this room. Uh, and probably about 50 fluted points from this area. And again, this is a classic hunting site uh, where you've got fluted point sites occurring on both sides of Sinking Creek, the mouth of Sinking Creek at the Tennessee River. If we look at it on a satellite view, again, you can see Sinking Creeks coming through here. And then just a quick picture. This is a picture of the peninsula there. And if we could imagine game being herded into Sinking Creek with flanking sites sitting on these two bluffs. And Hayes, you've been here, right? Yes. This is a steep area, right? These are pretty steep bluffs. It, no, not, not there. Up, up the creek. Up, up more. more? Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Go up another inch. Right there. That's steep. Right. And when you get up there into your last kill zone, it's yep. 75, 80 feet. Right. So this would be, of all the places that we've looked at so far, maybe, maybe the next one. This is the one that I could see most likely being uh, a drive line for hunting. And again, you've got not only drive blinds at the entrance and overlook, but drive blinds on both sides of the river as they're leading herds into this area, probably from, again, going back to that map where we showed the sites being driven this direction, right? They would have been driven into here or into P1. Yeah. All right, one more. This is the last one uh, I wanted to talk about, but this is a, this site's been a secret for many years. I worked with one of the people who discovered this site. Uh, this is the Heaven's Half Acre of Lauderdale County, 200 plus fluted points from this site. I remember uh, one of the people who discovered this site brought his collection to show me uh, when I was working in Huntsville. He brought a fishing box, three level fishing box. There were 50 fluted point fragments in that fishing box. And he told me that the other five collectors that discovered this site had similar collections from there. Uh, but this, this site, Almost nothing is written about it other than what you see in Wazakoff and Hodge's report, but a very, very dense group of fluid point sites occurring around Sinking Creek and Bell Sink in Lauderdale County. LU-409 probably has produced 100 fluid points by itself. Well, it's one of the most dense fluid point sites that nobody knows about. And again, I guess you can probably already see <laughs> from what we've talked about so far, um, a satellite view real quick, but, and some photographs. These are the outer margins, drive line lines, uh, sinking creek in the distance there, tree line. And then here we're getting to uh, Bell Sink, this is Bell Sink, and you can tell it's water. And I want you to notice, too, it's, it sits much lower. It's, it's pretty low in elevation. So it kind of lends itself to a potential hunting area. This is private property, so don't any, everyone just go out there. But Sinking Creek, and you can see this is LU-411. This is a dense flu point site. <clears throat> LU-409 here. 100 plus fluted points. And they're sitting above this very deep sinkhole. 
And just like Pride Landing, you know, if you can imagine what a drive line would have looked like, you know, this place really lends itself to that kind of point of view because you've got very deep sinkhole coming up onto higher land, perfect place to ambush prey, uh, very dense fluid point sites that are in this kill zone here. And then on this eastern side of Bell Sink along Sinking Creek, again, the creek is, is narrow, probably 20 yards wide uh, with the floodplain, 100 yards wide in this area, but it's flanked on both sides by a fluid point site. So you could easily imagine drives taking place along this section of Sinking Creek. <clears throat> and again, to remind everyone, this system would not necessarily have needed to have been used all at the same time. It's modular. They could have just used this, could have just used this, or could have used the entire system if they needed to, depending on how much game they needed to take. So what now? I mean, we don't really have any proof that any of these sites were used for hunting. I think it's possible. I, I don't know for sure, but how could we prove that? How could we possibly prove that? You know, I think the only way that we really can really do that is to continue recording and studying these sites, uh, really particularly, perhaps maybe some core sampling so that we can see what's happening in the bottom of these sinks. Uh, continuing retrofit. It'd be interesting to see if there's any, with the advent of LIDAR technology, if there's any way to see megafauna or faunal remains, bone piles underground, like we do pyramids. So I wonder if there's technology to be able to see what's under the ground in some of these sinkholes or kill zones without having to dig anything. But obviously excavation is one way we could do that. It's usually cost prohibitive. The number one thing that I think that we need to do is we just need to start looking at these sites through new eyes and not just through the eyes of a fluted point maker, but a fluted point user and how they would have used their technology to hunt and capture game in North Alabama and in particular in Lauderdale and Carver County. Thank you. Appreciate it.